Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the course BC213 on the end times. Um, today we have two lectures and I uh, look forward to that. Let's um, take a moment to pray together and then we will start. Could uh, one of us please lead in prayer and then we will get started. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for another opportunity to be equipped in your word, to be equipped for ministry. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor who you have strengthened and enabled him so far, Lord, to impact wisdom and the knowledge of you and understanding of your word for us, Lord, to be ready for the assignment you have ahead of us. We commit this time, Lord, spent listening to your word taught and instru instructed to us. We pray that as we listen, Lord, as we learn, open us up, Lord. Give us wisdom, Lord, to capture the depths of the understanding you need us, Lord, to have. Lord, so that we'll be worthy verses in your hand mm. for the work you have ahead of us. Thank you, everlasting Father, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, and good morning, everyone. So, uh, in this course on, on the end times, we completed this uh, section on uh, a panoramic overview of the sequence of events. We um, in the chapter 6, the notes that are given, and then, of course, we went through Revelation. Uh, we started with the, the rapture of the church, and then we went through the sequence of events all the way to Revelation 22, which is the new heavens, the new earth, and we tried to outline uh, events that would take place. Now, we didn't get into the details, uh, you know, reading every chapter and verse uh, on, on this. Uh, we will keep that for another course in uh, our third year when we will, you know, go through the book of Daniel and uh, Revelation. We'll read verse, the chapters, prophetic chapters and the scriptures, the verses and explain them. Uh, so we will do that in a separate course. But here, our plan, our intent was to kind of give an overview of the events, sequence of events, so that we're very clear how things are going to unfold. So, and then the next chapter, which uh, I planned to get into today was the signs of the times. So, uh, which is uh, just a listing of uh, what are the signs that kind of indicate to us where we are uh, in terms of uh, this prophetic calendar or this sequence of events that are about to unfold, how close are we uh, to the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation? So uh, we, I wanted to um, plan to get into that. Um, but before we get into it, uh, I just wanted to give us some time for some questions, questions or discussion. Uh, if you have, you know, if you just wanted to clarify some things about uh, the sequence of events, I will share the chart, which is in the PDF that we had uh, uh, released earlier. So just as something to reference as part of our conversation. And then, you know, this is this is of course a very high high level um, uh, view of um, the sequence of events that we were going through. So uh, we are here right now in the church age, which began on the day of Pentecost around AD 33. And we are somewhere towards the end of the church age. Uh, we will look at the signs of the times to see how close we are. Um, but what we did say was the first thing that we are looking forward to is the rapture of the church and the, the, all believers will be taken over into heaven. And in heaven, we have various things happening. Um, we are ushered into our mansions. We 
uh, our works are tested, we receive our rewards, uh, there's a marriage supper of the lamp and so on. And then uh, there is on earth these seven years of tribulation, uh, which we went through, that is Revelations chapter 6, all the way till Revelation 19. And then Revelation 19 brings us here at the end, the battle of Armageddon, where Christ comes with thousands and ten thousands of his saints, that is all of us who are in heaven, we come here. And there's a battle of Armageddon. And um, then right after that, you know, those who died in the tribulation are raised up as well. And uh, uh, we reign with Christ for a thousand years. Uh, those who've lived through the tribulation, they, they move in to this millennium for a thousand years. But Christ rules literally here on earth. And we are serving with him on the earth. Satan is bound for a thousand years and uh, that at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loose for a brief period um, and uh, he is finally wrapped. Uh, he is finally defeated and cast away into the lake of fire. Uh, all the dead are raised. There's a great white throne judgment. Then there's the renovation of everything, of heavens and the earth. And there are new heavens and the new, a new earth and there's a heavenly city, Jerusalem, that comes onto the new earth, and then we are with Christ in eternity. That's uh, chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. So um, I just want us to, I want to make sure that uh, all of us are clear with the sequence, with this sequence of events. And if you have any questions, uh, now is a good time for us to discuss before we get into um, um, talking about the science of the time. So any questions? Any things you feel we need to clarify or we didn't um, explain? Um, we can bring it up now. OK. So there's a question from Christopher. There's a difference between, please provide distinction between Hades, hell, and the lake of fire. So the lake of fire, if you, uh, let's say if you work backwards, the lake of fire is the final destination. It is the place where even hell itself will be sent to. Right? So that's the lake of fire. Now, hell uh, is also a place of torment. Um, it was prepared for the devil and his angels. And um, now at this time, so this is before, uh, before, the, uh, before the hell being cast in the lake of fire. Now at this time, those who reject Christ those who die without Christ go to hell. It's also a place of torment. And those who die with Christ, they go to heaven. So hell, you could think of, is a place of torment, but it's a temporary holding place. And hell, and those who are in it, and will be cast into the lake of fire. What are the, some of the other things that we do know? Uh, we know that there are different compartments, so to speak. Um, there was what was referred to as uh, Abraham's bosom, which was not necessarily like in hell, not in the place of torment, but we refer to as uh, as Hades, uh, in Hades, um, where Old Testament saints were temporarily held, also referred to as paradise, before they could all be taken into heaven. This was before the cross. So paradise, which was part of Hades, was there temporarily, and that was taken up into heaven when Christ ascended. Paradise was taken up. The other things we know is that uh, in hell, there is uh, what is referred to as a bottomless pit. Um, in hell, there are angels that are imprisoned and kept in chains. 
Uh, these were angels that uh, disobeyed God. And for whatever reason, these particular angels are kept in prison. Uh, they sinned uh, not only in the rebellion with Lucifer, but also in Genesis 6, they sinned. Uh, and so they are kept in chains here uh, in hell. So we know those little, little, you know, those bits and pieces of information about hell, um, which is a place of torment. But then what we do know when we read in Revelation 20, verse 15, that is at the great white throne judgment, hell will be cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is like the final destination. Probably, you know, it's called the lake of fire, for good reasons, it's probably even more tormenting than what hell may be. Now, so these are things that we know, you know, about hell, about Hades, about paradise, about the bottomless pit, about prisons in hell, about the lake of fire. It's okay, Christopher. Um, so, uh, so Christopher's follow-up question, just to confirm, uh, Hades does not exist anymore after Jesus came to the earth. Uh, well, paradise, which is a compartment uh, of Hades. So if you look at Hades, Hades had two compartments, paradise and hell. So the paradise compartment of Hades no longer exists. That was taken up into heaven because that temporarily held the Old Testament saints until Christ could finish his work on the cross, right? So if you, you can imagine Hades, which is the place of the dead, had two compartments, paradise and hell. Hell is the place of torment, paradise or Abraham's bosom. That part does not exist anymore under the earth, but paradise has been taken to heaven. But hell, as a part of paradise, uh, Hades, ex exists now. Was that clear? Okay. Uh, I'll wait for Christopher's response. But in the meantime, um, Anita, Anita's question is about New Age teaching. Um, so, um, New Age teaching, I would say it became very prominent. I mean, I, I guess it's been in, in existence in some form for a long time, but it became kind of more prominent back uh, starting in the 90s or maybe 80s and 90s when a lot of celebrities, like uh, movie celebrities, Hollywood celebrities, uh, began to you know openly... Uh, talk about new age and all of that. So, uh, and I, I haven't studied new age in depth, but this is based on a couple, some books or some reading that I did, and this was back in the 90s. So, uh, you know, I haven't read on those things lately. Um, uh, so, basically what new age is, it is an amal amalgamation of all teachings from all religions. You know, you make up your own. It's a mix uh, for everything. So they pull in from all the Eastern religions. They mix in everything they want. You can mix in the Bible with teachings from and uh, quotes from anybody. Any, any, it's basically you make it up yourself. You know, basically you 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 come up with your own ideas, and so and uh, and uh, it is uh, you know enhancing your personal spirituality, connecting with you know this supreme being or whatever and you have a mix of ideas uh, some go into uh, um, angelic visitations and so on so back in the 90s I read a book called Deceived by the New Age uh, I forget the name of the author but uh, that book kind of uh, explained in depth how this man made his journey into the New Age and he began to have uh, uh, you know these these great experience, spiritual experiences, but, uh, uh, you know, so-called encounters with Jesus, but actually it was 
uh, angels of darkness appearing as Jesus and appearing as angels of light. And so his whole book, the book is itself called Deceived by the New Age. And, and he talks about his journey into it and his journey out of it. So it was very interesting reading and, and to see how you know people get caught up in this. And there are, there are they claim all these spiritual experiences, which later on you realize that actually from angels of darkness that appear as angels of light. Uh, the, the reason that New Age teaching became so popular, one was because of, like we said, you know, there were big celebrities who were talking about it openly. And so obviously you know, all their fans and others, you know, would explore it. And secondly, it is uh, it is not as, uh, well, what do we say? Um, uh, if you use the word structured or, uh, you know, uh, like a formal type of religion. You know, uh, it's like you make up whatever you want. You get your own experiences and you learn from what others are experiencing and so on. Yeah, but it's basically a mix of all kinds of ideas. They, they, they even quote from the Bible and every other religious book and anybody's philosophy and ideas. So, All right. Um, let me uh, just try to look at Revelation 20 verse 5 and then we have somebody who lifted up their hand, I think. I see Revelation 20 and verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So uh, we have people, Revelation 20 verse 5 is talking about the rest of the dead. Who? What, what does it mean? So, you know, uh, um, all the dead in Christ, all the Old Testament saints, have received their resurrected glorified bodies at the rapture, which takes place before the tribulation. There are lots of people who've died before the rapture without Christ, they remain dead, meaning they are still in hell. Then during the tribulation, we have more people who are dying in Christ for the faith in Christ and all of them who die during the tribulation in Christ, because as believers, will be resurrected at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the tribulation, which is Revelation 20, verse 4. But all the others who die remain dead. So that's what Revelation 20, verse 5 is saying. So at the end of Revelation 20, verse 5, whom do we have alive? We have all those who have died in Christ, all the saints, that is Old Testament, New Testament, who have died in Christ with their glorified bodies. They've been resurrected. They are the glorified bodies. And you have people who have come through the tribulation who have not died. So they're coming into the thousand-year reign of Christ. So you have them. And that's how we enter into the thousand years of reign of Christ. So in the millennium, you've got people with their glorified bodies, and you've got people, natural people, or people without the, you know, natural, in their natural bodies, who transition from the seven-year tribulation into the millennium. But all the others dead, remain dead until the end of the millennium, until Revelation 20, verse 15, um, um, uh, you know, the great white throne judgment, which you read in Revelation 20, 12, and 13. Is that Okay. Um, all right. Say, did you raise your hand? Um, I'm not sure. No, Pastor. No. Okay. All right. So we go to Christopher's next question. Do unbelievers have their bodies? How do they get tormented with only their spirit? That is, feel intense heat. So remember, uh, the spirit, the inner person, is actually more real than the physical person. So, you know, in, in the other course where we are talking about developing the human spirit, the human spirit is more real than the physical. And the human spirit has faculties, just like the physical body has faculties. So the human spirit can also feel. And uh, so right now, when a person dies, the body is decayed. So the physical senses are gone, but the spirit 
faculties are still there. And they, with the spirit goes to heaven or to hell. And they're tormented in hell. And uh, so that's, so they still feel the torment. And when in Revelation 20 verse 12, it says, I saw the dead small and great standing before God and the books were opened. Um, and also in verse 13, it says, the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. Uh, it's not telling us whether they are being raised up with some body, natural body or physical body, or is it only their spirit? I'm assuming it's only their spirit. And I'm making an assumption because it's not clear and whatever assumption you make, it's fine. But my assumption is that this dead, Revelation 20 verse 12 and 13 are, when they says that the sea and the, you know, the sea gave up the dead and everyone who ever lived to stand before God, the dead. I'm assuming they are in their spiritual beings. But remember, the spiritual is more real than the natural. And the spirit, spiritual person has the faculties and has functions. And so all of that is going to experience torment eternally. Okay. It's interesting how Jesus uh, uh, communicated that when he was describing hell. Um, uh, let me just look up the verse. Uh, you could go ahead and ask your question, Christopher. Uh, I will. Uh... Uh, yes, Mr. I just wanted to uh, now also just uh, uh, get some uh, sort of clarification on why um, God would want to lose uh, Satan after a thousand year period when, uh, you know, this thousand year period is like. A near, nearly a sort of like a, uh, you know, a perfect situation that Satan has has been uh, has been bound for for you know for that for that for those thousand years, um, and um, why would why would God want to lose Satan, you know, after after this kind of near perfect uh, situation uh, uh, a period of time? So I just wanted to understand if you have some uh, if there's some uh, indications about why that happened. Oh, why that will happen, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this was a question we, uh, I, uh, I didn't answer, but I think I put it back to the class and um, uh, we answered this question together where uh, there were different ones in the class who shared uh, their, their thoughts and it seemed to, um, we seem to come to a consensus that uh, God is doing this to test people, whether they are genuinely committed to Jesus Christ. Because remember, like we said, you know, a thousand years, no problem. You know, there's no devil, no evil spirit to trouble us. You just, everybody's worshiping Jesus, you go. There's no devil to deceive. So they're really not being tested from that perspective. So I think the consensus was that uh, the reason why God is deciding to, or has decided to release Satan for that period of time is that he would go and deceive. It's like a test, you know, do you want to really follow Jesus? Or are you going to believe the devil? And I think as part of that discussion, we also follow, followed it up with a second question, which is how could the devil deceive people? And that's when uh, I think a couple of people pointed out, you know, in the Garden of Eden, it was a perfect state. Uh, and even there, the devil came and deceived Adam and Adam and Eve. You know, he got them into trouble in a perfect environment. You could not have asked for anything better. And yet over there, he managed to deceive. And the way he did it was questioning what God said. So it's very likely in the thousand year, at the end of the thousand years, he's going to deceive people in a similar manner, similar trick. 
did God really say? You know, make question what the Lord Jesus promised. Like maybe his questioning could be, did God really say there's going to be a millennium or is go I mean, uh, there's going to be new heavens and new earth and things like that. You know, so that seemed to be the answer. Uh, you know, it's just us thinking through it. We can't give chapter and verse for it. Uh, but if you think through, it seems like a logical answer why God would uh, release Satan at the end of the thousand year period. Yeah. Uh, anybody else wants to add to it? Okay. Okay. Uh, we have one more question. Um, Avni. Uh, you said one third of all angels abound in hell. Then who does Satan use to run his kingdom in earth? Who oppresses people? Are these evil spirits where they come from? Okay. So, Avni, I, 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 sorry, I did not say one third of fallen angels abound in hell. Um, what I did say was of those one third fall, fallen angels, there are some of them who sinned further. And you read about them in Genesis, the sixth chapter. Um, uh, it says here that Genesis 6 and um, uh, which was am I looking at here? Uh, so Genesis 6, um, verse 4. So there were fallen angels who came in to the women on the earth, Genesis 6, 4, and those angels out of the third of the angels are bound in hell. And we read about them uh, in uh, Second Peter and, and also in Jude. Um, let me just give you the exact verse. So Second Peter. Um, um, okay, Jude. Let me, let me just give you these. I, I can't remember these references offhand here, but Four, four, two, four, I think. This is Second Peter chapter two. And yes, yeah. So Second Peter two, four, yeah. So it's not all of the all of the one third. So one third fell with Lucifer. Out of the one third, some of them committed that sin in Genesis chapter six, verse four, and those angels are bound. Second Peter chapter two, verse four, they are cast in hell and they're held up in chains. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Sorry, Give sorry. Me. No problem. All right. Any other questions? In the new, uh, the new. Earth, will the population grow? Uh, from our understanding, uh, no. And the reason we say that is because in Matthew 19, Jesus says um, that, where's this, Matthew 19. Um, okay. Um, oh. Let me give you the exact verse here. Um, I'm not in Matthew 19, I'm sorry. Um, okay, um, it's not Matthew 19. Um, okay, let me just look it up for a moment. Just give me a moment, I will look it up. Okay, oh, so this is in Matthew 22, Matthew 22. All right, so in Matthew 22, uh, let me give you the exact where so I'm looking it up here. Matthew 22, verse 13, right? 
Jesus said, Matthew 20 to 30, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So Matthew 22, verse 30. Right? So um, in the resurrection, so post-resurrection, in the glorified bodies, we are like the angels. So angels don't procreate amongst themselves. And so we are like the angels is what... Um, Jesus said. So based on that, my conclusion is in the new heavens and the new earth, uh, there will procreation. There won't be procreation. This is just, you know, um, I'm not saying that this is the final word. I'm just saying it's my understanding based on Matthew 22 verse 30. Uh, but if you look at Revelation 21 and 22, there is no yes or no. You know, it doesn't necessarily tell us, but based on Matthew 20 to 30, uh, we could arrive at this conclusion, but it's not uh, final. Okay. The reason I say is when you, when you get to new heavens and the new earth, and in case the population is growing, please don't tell them in the end times course, I was told. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay. All right, Louis, what's your question, please? Um, good morning, sir. Um, there's a trend going on um, in this part of the world about um, putting timelines to when we should be expecting Christ. Um, I know it has gone through many phases over the years, but this time around, it's kind of um, taking a new dimension. I think the age range is between six to ten years. That's the purport time frame, but I don't know what your perspective is about on that. Mm. Yeah, see, um, my, my thought, and in fact, one of the signs that we're going to talk about is, you know, doing a little mathematical calculation. Anything we do, and even what I'm going to show you, uh, you know, because Jesus said one generation, and if you do that calculation on that one generation, you can arrive at some years. Anything we do, anything anybody does is just a guess, right? It's just like uh, us saying, look, we are really close because of all these signs we are seeing. And one of the things is we can use what Jesus said, one generation, and arrive at some, you know, some sort of a calculation. But it's still a guess. It's still a guess, you know, uh, and, and we should not take anything um, any guess, not even what I'm going to share with you uh, as, uh, as uh, you know, the word of the Lord. No, we don't do that. We just, Jesus just to told us to be watchful. He told us that, you know, he gave examples like this, like when you look up, the, look at the sky and you see the clouds are getting dark, you know, rain is about to come. So that's kind of all that we are doing. So to answer your question, we are very close. But how close are we? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 15 years? Is it 25 years? We don't know. Right? We've, nobody can say for sure. All we can say is, look, it's pretty, very close because of all the signs we're seeing, the clouds are really dark and it's going to rain. When will it rain? We don't know for sure, but we know it's really close. You know, that's all we can say. And anything else, I mean, we understand it's only a, it's only a guess that we're all making. Uh, nothing is, you know, God's word, you know, when, when we talk about a year or a time. Okay. Sri Kumar, your question, please. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, thank you, sir. Yeah. I want to know, um, as we are discussing on the rapture and uh, end times, so uh, we know that the Gentiles who are not uh, believing on Jesus will be, uh, you know, they will be left behind or they will not be taken. What happened to those um, uh, um, different churches with the different congregations? And uh, what happened to those churches, especially Catholic? I just want to know the Catholic one also. Because, um, you know, they believe that there is Holy Spirit and they perform signs, wonders, miracles, healing and uh, and they are saying that that's from the Holy Spirit. So um, will they be the part of the rapture or because um, even though they, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, but they don't believe on the truth. 
but they perform the science wonders and miracles so in that condition uh, how uh, how the things will be taken place that was my question thank you pastor thank you hmm. Hmm. now um, the fact is there are believers in all denominations you know, I mean genuine genuine born again believers uh, for example I, I i could have remained uh, inside the methodist church i mean i was born again uh, while I was in the Methodist Church and I got filled with the Holy Spirit while I was still part of the Methodist Church. Now I could have stayed there uh, and there are many people that I know uh, say in the Methodist Church or in you know many denominations who are genuinely born again who love Jesus but they have decided to stay in that denominational thing because for various reasons maybe god is using them inside the denomination to you know to awaken others to the truth so even in the catholic church inside the catholic church there is a move of god and this actually started back in the 1960s or 70s if you look at church history um, there was a charismatic renewal within the catholic church uh, and uh, I forget the year now, but I think it was somewhere in the 60s or 70s. And, you know, uh, one of them, uh, I think his name was Dennis Bennett. Uh, he was a well-known uh, well person who got filled with the Holy Spirit inside the Catholic Church. And then he wrote many books on the experience of the Holy Spirit and so on. So there have been some very influential people who not only were born again, but filled with the Holy Spirit within the Catholic Church, who, you know, then um, God used to initiate uh, the charismatic renewal within the Catholic Church. And that has spread globally so that, yeah, we, we have the Catholic Church, which we know from outside is, you know, is in, involved in a lot of rituals and worship of idols and worship of saints, which are all wrong. Um, so we have that dead structure that we are aware of, and even in many denominations, you may see that. But what we almost also must appreciate and recognize is within many of these denominations, there is a genuine work of God taking place. People are being saved and are being filled with the Holy Spirit. So that is happening inside the Catholic Church. And I personally know of people in Bangalore who are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, but they have decided to remain inside the Catholic Church. So that, inside meaning, in that, uh, um, you know, uh, religious environment, so they can influence a lot of other people. But they are born again. They don't worship any of the idols. They don't take part in any of these things, but they're staying there because they are influencing a lot of people. There's the charismatic renewal that's happening. So, so all, every person who's, Truly born again, uh, who, regardless of which denominational church or so on, they will be taken up in the rapture. And in the same way, there may be a lot of people in Pentecostal spirit, so called Pentecostal charismatic churches, who will be left behind because they're not, they may be just staying there because of, you know, it was nice to stay there. Maybe they generally weren't saved or whatever. I'm just saying that. At the end of what we know is those who are genuine believers will be taken up into heaven, uh, regardless of, uh, you know, where they are. Or you can even think of many Hindus and Muslims, you know. Uh, there'll be a lot of Hindus and Muslims, meaning believers. They have never stepped into a physical church or been part of a local church simply because of the various reasons, I mean, things. But they will also be raptured. So why? Because they genuinely say they genuinely believe in Jesus Christ. They just could just couldn't, you know, they didn't have the opportunity to be part of a local church. Uh, but uh, but that they believed in Jesus. Now, others may have thought they are Hindus or Muslims, but they believed in Jesus and they renounced everything else. And just that they couldn't come out and, you know, be part of a, um, a local congregation as such, the way we would look at it. So, you know, God knows, you know, uh, the Lord knows those who are his. So the Lord knows and they will be taken up. 
And, uh, you know, we'll all meet in heaven and those who are not saved will be left behind. Uh, uh, I, I, so I hope I answered the question. Yes, Master. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I see Rose is um, sharing there. I'm saved while I was serving in the Catholic Church as well. And then God let me on another denomination. Look at everyone just saying, screw me down there. Look at the heart of Jesus or this or that. Thank you. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you for sharing, Rose. Good. All right. Uh, any other questions before we transition to that? I just you know, just want to clarify if anything. So, um, Allah, um, uh, so we are all clear about the rapture of the church, the seven year tribulation, and so on. So, let me ask you a few questions. Um, can we give two good reasons, two good reasons why we say the rapture of the church will take place before the beginning of the seven year tribulation? Two good reasons. Why do we say the rapture of the church? will take place before the start of the seven year tribulation. Anyone? Just feel free, you can type it or speak it out. This is not a <laughs> this is not a quiz or anything. I'm just 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 want want us all to be clear. Uh, as I'm trying to remember the second reason, but the first reason number one is um, until the Antichrist is revealed uh, before the Antichrist has to be revealed, um, the Antichrist has to be revealed before um, the the Antichrist will be revealed after. Yes, after the rapture. So until the rapture takes place, the Antichrist will not be revealed. The reveal, revelation of the Antichrist is as a result of the rapture. Mm -hmm. So until that happens, um, until the rapture happens, the Antichrist. Will not be revealed. So that 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 that's one reason first. Mm -hmm. uh, good, good. Yeah. So the the reference to use for it, that is um, Second Timothy, uh, Second Thessalonians. Sorry, uh, chapter two, verse seven. That is, when he who restrains is taken out of the way, then the man of sin, the son of perdition, will be revealed. Right. So the rapture to take place, then this antichrist will be revealed. I see I, I see the comments there in the chat. CC has said, uh, God does not put believers to suffer. Yes, um, a reference for that will be 1 Thessalonians chapter five and also Revelation chapter three. Um, Abhishek says, we're not called to wrath. Yeah, that's Revelation three. Uh, uh, Christopher says, as believers, we will be saved from the wrath of God like no one the Lord. Common spirit is not faced to will look him. That's again, Matthew 24, where Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So how in the days of Noah, you know, the, the people who were saved got into the ark of safety. Then judgment was poured out. Then when it all subsided, they came back to the earth. You know, so that's a beautiful picture. Uh, yeah. Okay. I remember the second one, Pastor. Um, the rapture will only take place until the gospel of the kingdom has reached to the ends of the mm, earth. Mm, mm. Yes, Matthew 24 again. Correct. All prophecies fulfilled. Sukumar, yes. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, this is just, just, just want to make sure that we, we are all together. Next question is, at what point during the tribulation would the two witnesses appear? When will the two witnesses show up? Will it be at the start of the tribulation? Will it be at the... Okay, yeah, I see Beth's response. Uh, start of the second half of the tribulation, correct. The middle of the tribulation, correct. Avenue's there. Yeah. So 
next question. We have some time. Uh, which chapter is the beginning of which chapter in Revelation is what I'm talking about. Which chapter in Revelation is the middle of the tribulation? How many, how many chapters does Revelation have? What is half of 22? All right, that's your answer. Right, so Revelation chapter 11 is right there, the middle, beginning of the middle of the tribulation, right? So Revelation chapter 11, it begins like that. It talks about the temple being trampled by the Gentiles, and it says they will, it will be trampled for uh, 42 months, or so 1,260 days. That's right there. Yeah. So I don't know if how people decided on chapter and verse, but it all worked out fine. <laughs> 22 chapters, half of 22 is 11. Revelation chapter 11 starts with that, you know, um, saying that this is the middle of the tribulation, Revelation 11. So that's another way to remember it. But the real fact is it just gives us that detail there. Revelation chapter 11, it says, you know, there is remaining um, uh, 42 months, 1,260 days. Okay. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, one last question, then we can go for a tea break. You can relax a bit. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, uh, we read about the, uh, we read about the dragon, the red dragon, the serpent of old, who attempts to penetrate heaven, but Michael and the archangels push him and, and the dragon and his angels, they push him out and they cast him down to the earth. Why do we say that that event of Satan attempting to penetrate heaven is an event that is going to take place in the future and not something that already took place in the past? Why do we say that? This is in Revelation 12. Yes, yeah, so Satan's making an attempt to enter into heaven with all his angels. Why do we say that that is not a historic event, but a future event that is yet to take place or will take place? Why do we say that? Yep. So, but Sansa's right. Verse 12, right? Because in that same chapter, Revelation 12, it says, you know, uh, the devil is um, pushed back to the earth and he comes with great anger because he knows his time is short. He, it says that he knows this. That means, you know, uh, and, and then it also tells us later on in the 14th verse, it's, it's you know, uh, time, times, and half a time, meaning he knows it's just three and a half years. That's all he has. So he knows his time is short. And then the next verse 14, it tells us exactly what that duration is, three and a half years. So that's why we say that that description of Satan trying to get into heaven and Michael the angels pushing him back, Satan coming to the earth with great anger and knowing uh, is something in the future. Why? Because the whole, the way it's written, it tells us clearly, he comes with knowing that his time is short and he only has three and a half years left, which is right in the middle of the tribulation. That's when it will happen. And it's a, something out in the future that will happen in the middle of the tribulation, not a historic event. Good, good. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to let you de-stress out of this quiz time. <laughs> uh, please have your have a quick break. 
uh, we'll come back from the break and uh, we'll uh, we'll start off the next chapter we'll start talking about the signs of the times unless anybody has questions okay so um take a quick break we'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll get started with our next chapter okay thanks <laughs> 